an FBI agent, a special FBI agent, has just been charged with murder. Very interesting story. This case has been uh, being kicked around now for some months. Happened back in December of last year. And there is uh, new evidence now that is going to be going forward in a court of law. Let's take a look at this story over from CNN. Here is the picture of the FBI agent charged with the attempted murder of a man on board in Washington, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. area subway system. This was posted over at CNN, written by Christina Carrega and Whitney Wilde, posted the day June 1st. So this is the FBI agent. Now, weird case, right? This guy's been around here for a long time. They say he's an FBI agent. He served his community in dangerous and sensitive sensitive assignments for the last 10 years. We do not believe there is evidence to support these charges. We believe that once we get the opportunity to have a fair evaluation, he's going to be acquitted. So we know that the Metro Transit Police, they completed an investigation last year, December 21. They turned over all of the evidence to Montgomery County State Attorney for review. Then a grand jury indicted him on Thursday. Warrant was issued on Friday. FBI said in a statement that the Bureau is aware of the recent charges brought by Montgomery County, which is the Maryland State Attorney's Office. They're fully cooperating. They're going to be uh, following this up with an internal review. If he's convicted, he faces up to 30 years in prison for the top charge. So let's take a look at figure out what is happening here. So this is why he was charged. He was he shot another passenger during a confrontation aboard a moving subway train just outside of Washington. He was indicted on attempted murder and other counts. Big charge, right? Attempted murder is not something to scoff at. And his name is Eduardo Valdivia, 37. He was also charged with first degree assault, reckless endangerment, and use of a firearm in the commission of a felony stemming from the early morning encounter six months ago aboard a Metro Red Line train. Passenger who was struck was hospitalized with gunshot wounds, but survived. So it's an attempted murder charge. Valdiva was booked into Montgomery County Detention Center on Tuesday morning. That's this morning, according to online records and a jail official. After turning himself in, he's expected to appear in court later in the day. No trial date has been set. Law enforcement officials, they've described his actions as an extreme overreaction to a stranger with a history of aggressive panhandling who confronted the agent but did not physically assault him. There's been no indication that the man was armed. The criminal case against Valdivia is the second in recent months involving a federal law enforcement officer in Montgomery, a jurisdiction that's just north of Washington with about 1 million people. We have this other guy now. So the first the first FBI agent sounds like something that you, you probably have seen often when you go and use public transportation. You hop on a subway, hop on a city bus, driving around. You know, I used to ride the light rail here in Arizona uh, all the time. I used to ride it to law school. And I used to take the city bus when I was in high school all, all over the place. And you sort of see the same people on there a lot, of, a lot of the time. The same people asking for money, same people kind of just hanging out on the system, just doing laps around the city. So it sounds like this special FBI agent went in there and saw this person. Some sort of altercation happened and he pulled out a firearm and shot him and charged with attempted murder, assault, a reckless use of a firearm, reckless endangerment and some others. Now, what's interesting is this came out, so this came out of a grand jury proceedings where another officer was indicted out of the same county for a separate case, a whole separate set of circumstances, but out of the same county, same prosecutor's office. And so whoever the reporter was here that said, you know, we're covering this case, they just got a second, buy one, get one free kind of. We have on April 29th, we have an off-duty Pentagon police officer. This guy's name is David Dixon. He's indicted on two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. What? Prosecutors say Dixon shot at three men in Tacoma parking lot as they drove away and posed no danger to him. So this guy is a police officer at the Pentagon. Okay, the Pentagon is obviously an important place. Dixon's lawyers at a bail review hearing on Thursday said the officer acted in self-defense after the car had driven him and scheduled, he's, uh, had driven toward him. He's scheduled to be on uh, trial on September 27th. So... They drove away and posed no danger. They're saying, he's saying that the car had driven towards him, and so he had to shoot in order to uh, defend himself, allegedly. Both incidents were captured by security cameras in the parking lot, in the Dixon case, and inside the train in the Valdivia case. So wouldn't it be nice to see those two videos? We've got full footage of the FBI agent shooting that guy, and then we have the, the homeless person, and then we have Dixon here shooting the people in the vehicle, apparently driving away from him. 
he says differently. Since launching their investigation of the agent after the December 15th shooting, the FBI and Montgomery County State Attorney's Office have said little about how and why the shooting transpired other than indicating it was a verbal exchange and confrontation preceded the gunfire. Most comprehensive account was recorded a 911 call that was released by the county officials after a public records request. So we have two police officers, two law enforcement officials that are being charged with some pretty serious crimes like murder and attempted murder. And hmm, we want to get some information about what happened here. FBI and the Montgomery County State Attorney's Office being a little bit quiet about this, not telling us really what happened here. Why is it important that we know what happened here so that we can make sure that they are being accountable for their actions? Because what oftentimes happens here, as we know, the details are kept behind closed doors. We don't learn about these things until many months after they've happened, as happened here. And then when the formal inquiry starts, there's an investigation that takes place. Officers go through their formal reprimand or whatever procedure. Everything gets swept under the rug. Nobody knows about it. Right back to business. Well, now these are in the news. These are serious charges. These are attempted murder charges. And when journalists and people want to get more information about what happened here, they got to go and get it through a public records request. And they're being very quiet about everything that happened. According to a 911 call placed by another passenger who saw the encounter, the agent was confronted by a man and warned him to back away. The man instead prepared to fight him, according to the call. The FBI agent said, move away. I'm an FBI agent. Back away, the caller said. The other gentleman didn't, dropped his bag, approached him to fight him. The agent fired two or three rounds, according to the witness who called 911. The account did not disclose what was said before the shooting. This is what happened with the Pentagon officer. So this was back April 2021, so just about a month ago. Pentagon police officer accused of shooting three men now in a Maryland parking lot. They drove away. He's indicted on two counts of murder, single count of attempted murder. Grand jury also indicted Dixon Hall on assault counts for an unrelated incident last year where he allegedly pointed a shotgun and discharged pepper spray at a homeless woman. Okay, so uh, this guy got indicted on two different counts, one for an incident last year and then one for more recently. Taken together, all of the charges on Thursday exposed Dixon, who was off duty at the time of the incidents, to a possible sentence topping 200 years for one police officer. An attorney said he's going to plead not guilty to all of them. Mr. Dixon, said his, uh, his attorney, has been honorably serving the public for 20 years, including eight years in the military with tours overseas. He will vigorously contest these charges. The main case against him stems, stems from an encounter at 5 a.m. on April 7th. He was leaving his seventh floor residence at the Tacoma Overlook condominiums in his civilian clothes, headed for work at the Pentagon, according to police. In the darking, dark parking lot, he noticed a car with no headlights on. He went to check it out. Of course he did. As he drove up, police said he saw a man, one man outside the car trying to break into another car and confronted them. Video surveillance, according to the documents, captured what happened next. With all three men now inside their car, they drove off and Dixon filed, fired several rounds from behind the fleeing car, according to the documents. Quote, no longer presented an immediate threat that would have justified the use of deadly force. One of his rounds entered the upper back of Dominic Williams, 32, who was in the back seat, according to police. Another round entered the upper back of James Lionel Johnson, 38. He's in the front passenger seat. Driver Michael Thomas drove them to Prince George Hospital Center as they lost consciousness. So uh, this guy over here, David Hall Dixon, just starts you know, blasting uh, through, the, through the back of a car that's driving away. So this is him right here. Uh, Facing multiple charges, several different incidents. In the documents released in April, the Tacoma Overlook Condominium Board of Directors said it sent a copy to the Pentagon. New charges filed in the lobby case prompted the Pentagon to take a look at it. We have Jacqueline Yost over here, who is their spokeswoman. She declined to say whether the agency had indeed received and reviewed the video. First indictment on Thursday, charged Dixon seven counts, two counts of murder. Uh, counts of attempted murder, first degree assault in the shooting of Thomas, three counts of the use of a handgun during the commission of a felony. For counts related to Thomas, those charges could be merged. He could be sentenced, could not be sentenced for both counts. So we got some, uh, got some uh, law enforcement officials going through the justice system themselves, 
Isn't that interesting? Let's take a look at some questions over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. First up is Bessie Miento says, the very first thing a new president should do in 2024 is fire the top 25 of FBI officials. Corruption there will never change unless until all the agents are scared. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't even know. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to anger the FBI or anything like that, but they're basically, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, go on their Twitter and you can see what their efforts are focused on. Grandma who went in through the Capitol building. And that's about it as far as I can tell. Last question of the day comes in from Jeremy Matrita. Says, aren't the laws for the use of deadly force based on officers perceived threat? How is it possible for anyone to argue against another person's perception in the heat of the moment? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, right? And so, uh, Jeremy, what we're talking about here is sort of the difference between a subjective interpretation of events and ob an objective interpretation of these events. We spent a lot of time in the Chauvin trial talking about this and sort of trying to flesh out the difference between the two. If you are a, a, an officer at the scene, right, you've got a lot of abilities to perceive other things that people who are watching through a cell phone don't see and can't interpret. And so what we do is, as, as, as the law, is we identify what we call the reasonable person, uh, a reasonable officer, a reasonable lawyer, a reasonable doctor, and it's sort of supposed to be the objective version of that. We say, okay, if we just took a reasonable person and shoved them in that position, what would they have done? And then we measure their conduct against that conduct versus, and, and, and yet you sort of have to do that, right? Because how would it be, how could we possibly prosecute people if we applied their subjective interpretation to everything. So like, let, let's, let's use a self-defense case. What happens if you are somebody who is very, very concerned about being attacked late at night at a grocery store? And so you're walking your groceries out to your car, you get in the car and uh, somebody says, excuse me, and they're standing right next to you. And you go, oh my gosh, they're gonna attack me. And you pull out your gun and you shoot them dead, right? And we said, and we say, well, that's not, that's not reasonable at all. No objective person would do that, right? There's nobody in this world, no reasonable person in that person's position would pull out their gun and shoot them. And so that person would be charged with manslaughter or attempted murder or murder or whatever. Now let's say that we don't use that objective standard anymore. We say that whatever you were feeling, your subjective interpretation of the events is the law that we're going to use. And so that person, man or woman, whatever gender you want to ascribe that person, if they say, I was scared for my life. I thought that that person was attacking me. It was 9 p.m., okay? It was dark out. I couldn't see anything. I'm scared to death out here. He came up. I, you know, I, I didn't know who he was, and I thought he was going to kill me, and he said something scary. I couldn't hear it quite, so I shot him. And what if we as a society said, well, you heard her. You heard from the, from the lady or from the guy. She's scared to death. So they thought she just did what she thought was right. Had to shoot him. And so, you know, then... What kind of legal system would that that would that be? Everybody would just go around shooting each other and saying, "Well, I, I thought he was going to kill me. Sorry, you know, he cut me off. He deserved it." So we 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 ascribe this or or apply this objective person standard so that we have some more concrete rules when it comes to fleshing out these legal issues. And so when it comes to the police, it's got to be a reasonable standard, right? They can't just say, "Well, I was just personally scared. I thought that that bum was going to kill me." Well. Was it reasonable? I mean, did, was it reasonable for you to think that or not? Because if it's not, then your use of force is not going to be justified. So good questions. Thank you for all of those that came over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Quick reminder, if you want to sign up to be a part of the show, you can do so. Angie underscore has done it and want to welcome Angie to the community. The place where you can sign up is down here, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And hello, Angie. Thank you so much for joining up and being a part of the crew. Thank you to everybody who asked questions today. Once again, these came over from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you want to join us over there, you can. A lot of good things to download, things like a copy of my book. It's called Beginning to Winning. You can download a PDF version for free, or you can buy it on Amazon if you go over there. You can download a copy of all the slides that we went through. We'll share the impeachment party documents. That's available. You can download a copy of my existence systems productivity template, share links throughout the day and meet great people. There's a lot of good stuff going on, including our next monthly locals meetup coming up on June 26th. We just had one on May 22nd. 
So our next one is June 26th. It's free to all of our local supporters. If you want to join in on that, it's going to be a lot of fun. Also free Saturday, June 12th. So a couple weeks out, we have our law enforcement interaction training, which is going to be Saturday, June 12th from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to do this on Zoom and it's going to be fun. I'm actually excited about this. It'll be a fun thing to do in this format. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you can join us. And of course, that is for free. Again, if you're at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And then lastly, before we wrap up, I've got a couple other channels. I would love it if you supported us over there. Down below, we've got links to our r, &R Law Group Arizona channel. We have a crypto channel. We're talking about some of the watching the watchers components towards cryptography. So we talk about what the they're doing with regulation and uh, a lot of the interesting things that are happening with decentralization, having fun on that channel. So I would encourage you to go support us there. A couple others down there if you want non-live recorded content and uh, other great links down there. So thank you for supporting us. Lastly, before we wrap up, I am a criminal defense lawyer in Arizona. We offer free case evaluations. If you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who has been charged with a crime, we would love the opportunity to help. We can help with things like DUIs, drug offenses, domestic violence, anything and everything in between, any offense, you know, if anybody's been in trouble with the law before, we can help. We can clear up old records. We can uh, remove mugshots off the internet, quash old warrants. There's just a lot of work that we can do to help kind of move things back in the right direction. And so if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who needs a little bit of help and support in this space, we would love the opportunity to, to speak with them, make sure that they leave our office better than they found us. And that, my friends, is it for me for the day. We're going to be back here, same time, same place tomorrow for yet another show. And it's going to be at 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. And for that one Florida man, everybody, thank you so much for being here. And I want to wish you a tremendous evening, a lovely, restful night's sleep. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.